And, and I think, you know, the publishing landscape is changing. Um, and I hope that we, we do have more um, narratives from the, the minority writers coming out. And I, I do also know that it seems to non-minority writers that it it's kind of like a minority dominated landscape in publishing right now. I have heard that expressed, but um, I, I mean, as someone who's been looking for a story out of Korea for my whole life and, you know, really never seeing that until the last maybe two or three years, it's, it's just such a long way to go actually from our point of view. Um, so I just did want to bring that up. No, that's really important, Francis. Um, it's so important to hear this. You know, I, I, I was shocked when I read this also in your, um, I don't know, it was an interview or somewhere, this idea that you had never seen this particular, your per particular um, South Korean background represented in literature. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's just shocking, you know? So so it's important to say that, say these things. And um, it's actually wonderful. It's a great segue into discussing your book, which explores aspects of the South Korean experience that might be unfamiliar to American readers. Um, certainly it was to me and, and fascinating and um, challenging in some ways and really um, humanizing. So um, I thought we'd start by talking a little about the book and then move on to your experience publishing a debut novel with a major publisher. Um, so um, for those who haven't read it, If I Had Your Face is a fascinating exploration of contemporary South Korea told from the alternating points of view of four friends and correct me if I uh, mispronounce, okay, jump in, please, Francis. Um, Kyuri, Miho, Ara, and Sujin. Is that how you say that? Yes, okay. Um, as they make their way in the hyper-competitive world of Seoul, they face daunting obstacles, including socioeconomic inequality, impossible beauty standards, and a culture where women are often mistreated by men. Ultimately, though, it's their friendship that offers hope in this punishing world. Kyuri, Miho, Ara, and Sujin have known each other since childhood, three of them from the orphanage in which they were raised. With little socioeconomic advantage, they rely on their resourcefulness and each other to make ends meet, sharing a small apartment in Seoul in a Seoul office tell, which I learned is a multi-use building with both residential and commercial units. One of the things I loved about the book was the characters. You chose to start the novel from the point of view of Ara, who became mute as a child and worked her way up to become a hairstylist. Why did you decide to open the book from Ara's point of view? Um, I mean, when I first started writing, I didn't actually think that this would be a novel. I thought of it, I was workshopping at Columbia um, during the MFA program. And it, it started as a short story in my mind and I wanted to write a story. Um, I had just read about the Bechdel test. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but it's uh, it came out because a writer um, was speaking about how rare it was at the time to see female characters talking in a book about anything other than men and love. And I, I had to agree and that reading about that really uh, moved me at, at the time. And I wanted to attempt something that passed the Bechdel test. And it, it was also with Asian characters, which I had not surprisingly attempted before my graduate school years, even though I was um, writing fiction for so long as a child and as an adult, I always associated fiction like English writing with um, white characters. So it, it was a big departure for me to embark on this story. Um, and Ada, I, I started with her, I mean, or I, I just started the story about her because I was interested in a, a character who's kind of removed from the action and she's in her own world because of her disability, she's kind of cut off from the world and has a fantasy life. And um, it's also, I wanted to write a story about friendship and desperation um, as well. So that's kind of how it all started. And then as I kept writing, I imagined that they live in an office towel and uh, 
I used to live across from one or my mom's place is still across from one and I would constantly see young people kind of going in and out of this building and I would imagine what their lives were like um, which was so different from my life living with my mom and and kind of experiencing all the kind of the burdens of living with your parents um, very you know every single day and office towels the young people living in them are very uh cut off from their family in the sense that they're they're only there because they can't live with their families their families are living in the provinces usually so yeah um It's... Yeah, well, that's that's I mean, that's a great answer. Um, and I love the um, I love this idea. It's so true. I didn't realize that, that that's how you started. But this idea of um, women friendships and um, and you took it a really I, I think you made some very courageous choices with these particular characters. Um, and in particular, Curie, who is one of my favorite characters and the most challenging in some ways. Um, she has a really strong voice. Um, she's working in a room salon where um, I've learned businessmen come to drink and be entertained by women. Uh, but because she works in, in a 10% salon, which claims to hire the most attractive women in the industry, Curie is not required to have sex with her clients. So it's not that, but she is still under enormous pressure to conform to strict standards of beauty and has already undergone an eyelid and double jaw surgery. She quickly finds herself caught in a cycle of debt in order to pay for the cosmetic procedures that allow her to keep her job. But um, so as she navigates this ruthless world, Curie's voice can be startling. And I wonder, do you have your, a copy of your book with you? Awesome. Can you just read a little bit on page 13? Um, it's, it's a, it begins, um, it's really tragic getting old. So this is at the very beginning of the book. And, um, you know, again, it's a very, interesting and neat choice you made tell um, me when you sorry on page 13 on page I think it's on page 13 it's oh, although I have the paperback um is yours the paperback edition I okay I think it says on page 13 where it says oh yeah it's the it's the paragraph that begins the older girls have to try so hard it's the up <laughs> towards the top I, I think mine is a bit different. Oh, how strange. <laughs> oh, wow. Weird. Okay. Well, let me just, you know what then? Let me just read. Oh, girls have to try so hard with their hairstyles. Oh, yeah. Could you just read that passage? Oh, sure. It's really, the older girls have to try so hard with their hairstyles. It's really tragic getting old. I look at our madam and she is just the ugliest creature I've ever seen. I think I would kill myself if I looked that ugly. But you know what? I think we must be the only room salon with an ugly madam. It really makes Ajax stand out. And I think it makes us girls look prettier too because she is so horrifying. So she shudders. Yeah, Cutie is a very, um, very specific character. She, you kind of tell from her internal dialogue and, and from what she, says to her friends that how much she's been damaged from being um, in her industry and from conforming to these really uh, extreme standards of beauty in her particular small world and her circle. And I, I was very interested in, in her for being so so extreme, but so outspoken at the same time. And she is a foil to her roommate Miho, who is more kind of wary of what other people think of her and how she stands in society. And Cutie does not have that um, and is more unfiltered. So it was, it was great to kind of bounce them off each other in a relationship. And uh, yeah, she, so room salons are these kind of underground luxury um, entertainment, kind of the equivalent would be geisha bars in, in Japan. Um, and they are 
not really spoken about in polite society, but I was really surprised at how, you know, how many of the wealthy businessmen go to conduct business there and the glass ceilings that arise because women are not welcome to accompany them. Um, and also, you know, the women who work there really spiral downwards into a cycle of debt and psychological kind of being caged in that that idea that they're not worth um, more than they perceive. So that was just such an, a heartbreaking thing to research and interview. Yeah, it was really, and I think you were so courageous in giving Carrie this strong voice. It is harsh, and I think it challenges the reader to face the reality of her circumstances in a way that I just was rooting for her, her even more. Um, and, 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 you know, underneath her fierce exterior, she's also smart, resourceful, and caring. She sends money home to support her mother and reluctantly agrees to introduce Sujin to her plastic surgeon, even as Curie, too smart to see the trap in which she finds herself, um, not to see the trap, um, wishes her friend would not follow the same path, but they don't have a lot of choices. Um, you know, I feel like we're gonna, people are gonna wanna talk about, this time is just flying by, um, and we want to leave time to talk about your journey to publication. So I think I'm going to jump ahead to, I don't, we cannot talk about this book without talking about plastic surgery. Um, it's sort of the more sensational aspect of the book, but certainly to me, um, it was very much about friendship and um, the struggles of these women um, primarily. But nevertheless, um, I read a lot of articles about the book and um, the New York Times, for example, talked about, and here I'm quoting, the American feminist objective of being true to yourself as opposed to the South Korean obsession with achieving the feminine ideal all the way to surgically altering one's appearance. Um, I read the word obsession associated with South Korean plastic surgery a, a number of times and it really bothered me and I wondered, um, I wondered what your reaction is to that passage. Um, yeah, thank you so much for asking that. I mean, it's certainly one of the topics I get asked about most often and, you know, rightfully so because it's such a big storyline in the book, but I do find that very uncomfortable, I, I, I do my, feel myself getting very uncomfortable with kind of this judgmental Western um, view that, you know, South Korean women are shallow and vain and if anything, I wrote this book so that one could understand where these choices are coming from. Um, and if, if you are not born into wealth and status in a very highly competitive country, then for these particular characters, they are um, using it kind of as a commodity to make their lives better. And you know, who, who are we to judge people who simply want to make their lives better? And it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a very, loaded topic for me. It's it's in a way, you know, when I'm in Korea and speaking to Koreans, it's a different thing from approaching the same topic to someone of a different culture because you immediately, or I just immediately get more defensive um, and try to establish more context about the whole subject. But yeah, it's, it's just more, um, a, so to, to kind of trace that back, I also think it's a matter of accessibility, which is a, a big thing. Um, healthcare in general, not that you know plastic surgery falls under healthcare, but any kind of medical clinic is extremely accessible in a way that you can just walk into um, like a hundred different clinics uh, at any moment and get an immediate look. <laughs> and I do think that that also uh, contributes to how much, you know, pe people are making visits to different clinics. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm getting a bit distracted. <laughs> no, 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 it's fascinating. And you know, uh, that's, it's really interesting. Um, and, and actually I just, I looked up some statistics 
And um, while South Korea does perform more plastic surgeries in the U.S., uh, approximately 20 per thousand people compared to 13 in the U.S., the statistics also depend, apparently, on how procedures are reported. So an eyelid surgery, for example, which is one of the most common in South Korea, could require several procedures during one surgery, while liposuction or breast augmentation, two of the most frequent surgeries in the U.S., require fewer different procedures. And the reason I raise this is because I just think the idea that American America is not obsessed with with you know standards of beauty or that that um, plastic surgery and and um, cosmetic procedures aren't rampant I, I you know just didn't seem fair to me to kind of compare them that way um so um, um and actually one of the things you mentioned in your book club guide which I recommend to everyone it's a wonderful conversation is that South Korea is a more homogeneous society than the US with less diversity of racial backgrounds and that the pressure to look a certain way can be higher because women are up against a more widely accepted standard of beauty rather than several diverse ideals. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. It's also, um, I think this push to broaden the norms of beauty is also quite recent in the West. And I wondered if you have any additional thoughts before we go on to, unfortunately, I have so many more questions, but we have to get on to the question of publication, but having lived in both South Korea and the US. Yeah, um, there are certainly very kind of much talked about standards of beauty in Korea that are not Western beauty standards. For example, there's this fixation with a small face, um, very clear skin, and um, kind of these big eyes, and it, it kind of, the list kind of goes on and on. But again, I think it does trace back to um, being a, a racially homogenous society for most of its you know, 5,000 year existence. And so that's been kind of carried down for a long time. And what's interesting in recent years is that because it's such a shrinking population, it has the lowest birth rate in the world because of all these, you know, so many different societal issues. Um, so first of all, like high unemployment rates leading to people not able to save up enough to um, buy an, an apartment or have children. And because of that, uh, Korea is making up its labor force through immigration from other countries. And if you go to the provinces in particular, you'll find that most of the elementary schools are actually minority children, which is for the first, you know, this has never happened before in Korean history. And we have um, a minority senator for the first time. And so it's going to affect, I think, the way that beauty is talked about. Um, and hopefully there will be more, um, you know, more accepted ideals of beauty. And I think that that is very true today. But again, it's something that I, I do feel sometimes very self-conscious and kind of defensive when talking to a Western audience because it, it there's this like, top-down judgy kind of view that I, I get so uncomfortable. Well, it is so ironic that, the, that it, it, you know, America is touting itself it is so open and, 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 you know, accepting of, you know, you be you, and then there's this judgment. Anyway, it's, you know, I can certainly understand that I felt offended reading it, so I just really can only imagine what it was like for you. Um, although again, I th think the intent, you know, the intent, we're all trying to grapple with these questions, you know, and, and it's, we're all being tested in different ways. And, um, and that's actually why it's so important that this book exists and, and it's wonderful that you're, um, here to share your views on it. And thank you. Um, so we, we, I could talk about the book forever, but I, you know, I know that there are people in our audience that uh, really wanted to hear about your journey to publication. So we're going to talk about that. And I also, I can't unfortunately um, really look at the chat at the same time. And I think there's been some chatter on the chat, um, but we will leave time for some questions at the end. So um, for those of you who are wondering about that, yes, we will. Um, so first let's um, talk about 
um, you know, there, was there anything that surprised you in terms of getting an agent, working with your agent, or once the book was acquired by Penguin Random House, basically open-ended question, anything that, um, you know, that you, that you, you found surprising or interesting about the process? Yeah, I, um, I was very obsessed for a long time during the writing of this book. Uh, you know, you kind of obsess about the publication process uh, simultaneously, and sometimes you're just reading about agents um, in a way that is actually, when it, in retrospect, is very not helpful because it just takes away from your writing time, and you are worrying about something that's out of your control anyway. <laughs> But uh, for me, from the first words on the page to publication, it was 10 years, and that's a very long time. <laughs> um, and it, a, lot, a large part of it was because I took time off from my MFA to go work in when um, I had a family situation back home that I had to take leave of absence from school. And then when my, when my father passed away, I took a job in in very close to home um, so I could take care of my mother. And so taking a full-time job that first time obviously delayed the process. But I think um, getting, in, in terms of getting an agent. Well, that, Francis, I'm, can I just interrupt you on that? Just because we also had a question. This is, do we can sneak this in from one of our, from our audience. Um, you know, I, I'm struck by, when you said it was a very long time to write the novel, but I don't think it's that uncommon. And, um, you know, as writers, we really have nothing to write about if we haven't lived. So obviously these detours um, in your journey ended up being incredibly valuable for the story. Um, and and um, one of our um, audience members particularly wanted to know about the character of Ara and how much research you did um, in order to capture the viewpoint of someone who can't speak. So how much research, I think, I guess there's quite a bit of research involved in this book. Yeah, Ada, um, so she is mute. And uh, I, that also came about when I resumed studying. She was actually, she didn't start out mute. I made her mute later. That's something I've actually never talked about before. But it, it was because I spent, a lot of time at this job um, and it was a very silent job because it was a Korean conglomerate and I would kind of sit in silence for I think it was like 10 hours a day every single day for you know years and kind of withdrawing into myself because of that and my grandmother was deaf uh, I grew up with her and I would go see her every every week and she had other disabled um, friends, including someone who was mute. And I would see her there. There's like a, it's called a noinja where um, people kind of get together and play this game called Go. So just interacting with um, different, I guess, di different disabled people while myself being in a very isolated, silent environment kind of made me want to research more about being mute. And I did go down this very, very deep rabbit hole of researching and, and kind of trying to interview my grandmother's friends and things like that. But um, a lot of going back to the publication as well, it was, yeah, I, I tried to get an agent kind of cold email agents and I was keeping a running log of how many agents I was not hearing back from. Um, and that was depressing. And then the way that it often happens, I heard back from three agents the same week, which was really strange. And I was offered representation um, at the same time. But I, I think also I, I was very careful not to go out too early, but what happened was I felt like I, it delayed my process by several years thinking that I wasn't ready yet. And the real catalyst for starting to submit was when I talked to a friend who was a lawyer in publishing and she was saying that, no, you know, you don't necessarily have to think that your fiction submission is absolutely ready. 
um, you should just go out because you'll never think it's complete. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's really true because I was several years away, I thought, uh, before I submitted. But um, it was interesting because all the two agents that, two of the three agents were Korean that I received offers of representation from and they were so like shocked at the, the story um, and, and so delighted that it was set in Korea um, because I think they hadn't read anything like this particularly. And then the other non-Korean agent was also very, um, you know, said nice things, but I felt like because the Korean agents, both of them uh, really connected with it on a level that I so appreciated because I was always very nervous about the subject matter anyway, because, you know, of how rare it is. I was like, oh, well, maybe it means that editors wouldn't want it. Um, so I, I wanted to go with someone who would really advocate for it in a very personal, like personalized mission kind of way. <laughs> um, and it ended up just, you know, my agent Teresa is, has been just so incredible. So she acted as my first editor essentially. So, and gave me a lot of editorial suge suggestions. We changed the title. She um, thought it would be better to add two more chapters. Um, and so I worked with her on that for several months. And then- And, and Francis, was that, did that happen after you had signed with her or was that sort of, um, okay, so that's nice. So she wasn't, she wasn't kind of saying, Alex um, represents you if you make these changes, she'd already committed. So that gave you the confidence to know that she was, you know, kind of behind you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, well, I'm, I'm so curious what your original title was. Are we allowed to ask? Um, it, I, I'm kind of saving it for my next that's book. That's fine. Oh, for your next book. Okay. Well, this is a great title. So, all right. That's exciting. Um, but that's nice. That, I mean, so that sounds like when you said that she's been wonderful, what, what, um, what to you would make a wonderful agent? Obviously she loved the book. She was willing to put time into reading it and carefully editing it. Right. Um, mm. and, and were there any other particular specific things that, you know, that you found, do you find that are, yeah, so what I really appreciated about her for this particular work was kind of walking the tightrope of balance between what to, it's, since it's all, the characters are Korean, the setting is Korea, and they're speaking Korean language, and it's, but it's written in English. It was a lot of, the questions I had was how much of the Korean should I keep in there? Mm -hmm how much explanation can I get, like how much explanation can I get away with not putting in there? Cause I want it to be as, um, I didn't want someone like me to read it and be kind of turned off because it was all explanation. I wanted it to be uh, just as much like as for someone like me. <laughs> uh, and so in the beginning, I actually had a lot more Korean words and I would, sometimes cut out a lot. So she really helped me with, with that and she understood my concern uh, on both sides. So that was so incredible to have her. And the other thing that I really appreciate is that she actually does not have very many clients. Um, she has, at the time she told me she had 10 total and, and, to, and that was, you know, so, cool that she could spend so much time um, and brain space with each client. And I think you know, she has very high profile clients and I just couldn't believe it when she took me on because you know, I, <laughs> I had no name. Um, and that was such a, such a moving experience for me. Yeah, that's really what a nice how nice we need to hear these happy stories of um you know the journey the publication journey and of course the book is a special book. Um so um that I did have an interaction with I did have interactions with other agents who didn't offer representation, but they did say, oh maybe you should change everything to 
one point of view, third person, like rewrite the whole thing in the third person. And that would have been such a crazy, difficult thing to do. And I was wondering, you know, it wasn't an offer of representation and then revise, revising, she was like, oh, maybe if you do this, I'll take another look. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> do I do this? Do I not? So that was um, kind of a torturous time to, and then I ultimately decided not to because I felt like it was such a subjective thing. And maybe, you know, if I didn't hear back from other agents after even, you know, some time, then I would try to go back and revise the way she advised because she was a very big agent as well. Yeah, well, that's really interesting because it just goes to show we all know it's very subjective, but if if things had not gone the way that they did, this book may not be the book it is, you know, I mean, it's and but as a writer, I think having um, written one book and having brought it through this journey of publication, you know, you now know you can do this, you can probably write your way out of a paper bag. I mean, that's what I always say. <laughs> I can kind of write anything now. Um, so, you know, it, and, and each book probably could be, each of these characters could have their own story. So there's so many variations um, on what a book can be, um, but it's nice to get it done and out and then it's kind of finalized because otherwise we could kind of tweak things forever. Um, but you had um, mentioned to me when we were speaking um, before the interview that, uh, oh, and actually, I'm sorry, let me interrupt myself. If anyone has questions um, from our audience, and I know some of you are upset that you can't see all the faces, we, we thought this would be the best way to, to conduct the, um, the interview, but please put your questions in chat. I have my chat bar up on the side, so any questions that come in, um, we'll, we'll direct them uh, um, immediately to Francis. Um, and they can be about the book or about the publication process. Uh, so Francis, you had mentioned that um, there were, you said that there's your, your agent wanted you to add two chapters at the end, I think you said, and then, and then when it was accepted by Penguin, did they, they also asked for additional um, revisions. I think you'd mentioned that's a lot. That's interesting. What, 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 what did they want? Is, what? Very unexpected did kind of my collaboration with my editor because she I had expected pushback about not italicizing the Korean words because I'd always seen you know foreign if it's in a different language they're usually italicized um, and I had expected more pushback about um, more contextualization and things like that but none of that came she was totally happy with keeping that as it is, which was quite shocking. But she did suggest there was a fifth narrator uh, and the suggestion was to take her out because there were too, too many. Um, and I completely agreed with that. That was one of the things that I had felt very in, unsure about to begin with. And so I ended up cutting one character out entirely and that was the character I had spent the most time on um, and years actually on her alone, but that's kind of turning into my second novel. So yeah, it's, it, it's been, and I, I had had the most trouble with having her story kind of arc because I'm always about backstory. I love, I could do backstory forever and I really hate Kind of pushing the story forward into an arc um, and with that particular character I, I had only backstory so it, it just made sense to excise her. That's that's actually an amazing story because um, that's a pretty pretty big change um, and you know the, it's, it's interesting going back to what you'd said earlier about yes you want to wait until your book is absolutely ready before you go out on the um, start querying agents, but um, at some point you have to make that leap. And you know, you had an agent who accepted the book and loved the book and made some changes. And then the editor went and did something, you know, asked for uh, yet more kind of significant changes. And I can see it's interesting when you. Oh, I'm sorry that you're telling when you when you mentioned that there was a, a fifth character. Um, I do feel like there's a lot of characters in this book in a good way, not, you know, not in a bad way. Each one is fascinating. Um, so, you know, having an extra one would be a lot in this space for the reader to, to um, toggle. But it sounds like that was destiny because, you know, 
she, we get to hear about her in your next book. And Juana was a character who um, was interesting to me. I know that um, I'd, I'd heard in an interview that she was actually one of your favorite characters in this, and um, and she's one, the only one that does, she doesn't live with the with the four friends in the office towel. She doesn't didn't grow up with them. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Juana and what her place is in the novel? Uh, so she, rep I, I started writing her when I was pregnant, and I think a lot of the anxieties that I had being pregnant and kind of in a dark place um, also manifested itself. But she, a lot of Korean women, I, I had mentioned the low birth rate earlier, but the, there is so much anxiety surrounding children um, in Korea because there is such a, an intense competition academically uh, and you know in the in the job world later um, so you just can't help worrying a lot um, and that kind of collective worrying from people around me made her made itself in, made its way into that character and I, I love her particularly because she is so damaged from her um, from her familial kind of intergenerational trauma. And that too is a, an all too common story because there has been historically so much burden and expectation placed on um, male children and the, so the daughters-in-law that, that marry into a family that have a lot of expectation placed on sons experience a lot of this um, trauma and that this is more in the previous generations you don't see any of that or not any but at less of that now uh, and I was just thinking of all the different women that I have in my life and what they've been through and, and those storylines. Yeah, and that's that was so specific to these characters in this world, but it's also such a universal theme. Um, and um, it's interesting that you say you like backstory. I think you actually did a really good job of weaving it. I like backstory too, but it can become you know unbalanced. And I think you wove it in in a really balanced way. So it gave the characters a lot of depth and certainly um, we know where they came from. I'm not gonna, Give any spoilers but we know where they came from we know what some of that inter intergenerational trauma is in their lives and how the world has changed so much you know how they are you know i had such um, empathy or sympathy for these characters who are trying to make their way in this hyper competitive world of soul um and actually there was a passage um on maybe you could read it it was really heartbreaking and powerful on um, page 151 um, and it begins with hundreds, no thousands of apartments. Let me see if that's the beginning of the, uh, it's in the middle of the, of that big paragraph. It's like halfway down hundreds, no thousands of apartments. Mm. Um, and let's see who's speaking this. I believe this is, um, Ara, this is Ara again. Yeah. Yeah, hundreds, no thousands of apartments so far away from the heart of the capital. And yet I will never be able to afford a single one, no matter how much I save all my life. In a way, I will be glad when we are almost home and the scenery will turn into rice fields and farm plots. And I will be reminded of how far I have come instead of what I cannot reach. And then, anyway, I mean, I think that's a, a universal thing to um, it's so, I mean, certainly in New York, when you see <laughs> so much real estate, um, the obsession with real estate, it, it's very comparable to Korea too, where uh, the real estate obsession, it's the prices are prohibitive for young people, which impacts the next generation's dreams and, and realities. Um, but here, I feel like the option is at least you can move out of New York and go to a more affordable state. And it's less so in Korea where the provinces are increasingly kind of 
abandoned um, and everyone, everything revolves around soul. That's a really interesting dichotomy. I mean, I think we do have that in the States in terms of areas where, you know, factory towns that have been decimated um, and, you know, many of them, when new businesses don't come in, um, a lot of them, the only thing keeping them going is low paying um, minimum wage jobs or tourism. But then you do have a lot of smaller cities like Tampa or Colorado um, where young people are going and, and places where there are, is a lot more business. Um, so you don't see that happening at all in, in South Korea, like it's Seoul kind of, are there any other um, major cities or, or, or not? It's kind of just the Seoul or, or the provinces. Busan and yeah, there are other, other cities for sure. It's, but um, you know, I just read this past summer that the rate of increase in real estate prices is the highest in the world in Seoul. Specific. That's crazy. I mean, I just have to say, because that's like San Francisco before, you know, before everyone went remote was insane, you know, what you could get. And, and I, I guess I did, I looked up Office Tell and I was actually <laughs> ended down a rabbit hole of um, a real estate, actually a real estate site. And what, you know, couples were looking at in terms of the square footage and what was available. And it was really an eye opener because these are tiny spaces. Yeah, they're really tiny. Um, and it, I, I don't know it's it's really specific to Seoul I think and government the government has tried so so desperately to curb the right the rate and they're rolling out different policies to address it but it really doesn't work um, and every day when I was in Korea I go back every summer uh, and it's all about policies and different mm. laws to try to address this because it affects society um, on every level. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, um, again, it's wonderful to it, to get this contrast, something that's so different and learn about a different place and also so see the parallels and the universality of some of these issues that really are, you know, part of humanity in, in, in a sort of a shrinking globe. Um, we have a question from one of our um, audience members. Where do you learn to pitch to agents? Any specific books and websites you'd recommend and how should the query letter be organized? Um, you know, I'm gonna just jump in on this. I mean, you're welcome to answer this, Francis, but I will just say before you do answer that there is so much information about this on the internet and, you know, examples of query letters and, um, and, and just publishers marketplace is probably the best source in terms of um, getting a $25 a month membership and then you can, Google every single thing about every agent, but um, you know, in yeah. your particular case, Francis, what was what did how did you approach it? Um, I was reading obsessively all the publishing blogs, like Electric Literature, uh, different authors' interviews where they spoke about how they reached out to their agents, um, and I tried to go through uh, people I knew with agents, but it, it's always such a a little um, such an awkward thing to ask someone to introduce you. It was very surprising how you know some people were so generous with their their recommendations. Um, so Teresa, I went through a family friend of mine who is also represented by her, and she's also Korean. Um, so <laughs> again, it was a very Korean story. But she was so generous to introduce me. Okay, well, that's that's certainly that's nice to have that. Um, but it, um, it sounds like you had offers from other agents that were not necessarily, you know, um, recommendations. So certainly, you know, people do get get agents through querying, and um, um, and I encourage people to 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 do a lot of googling on that. Um, you know, and the query letter, I do, I think the query, query excuse me, query letter is incredibly important. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there are certain formulas for that, which we won't go into here, but there, that's really accessible online. Go ahead, Francis. I struggle with, you know, when you're on this, I was talking to a bookstore owner the other day and she was saying, what, what is your book about? And I just freeze up. <laughs> 
and I can't answer. It's still so hard to try to summarize a book, um, especially your book, <laughs> and have an elevator pitch for that. It's it's just so hard. <laughs> yeah, I think most authors, the sum, the synopsis is the most dreaded part of writing. It's the hardest hardest thing. Um, but being able to do that effectively is, is important. And your book is hard to um, encapsulate in a snapshot because it's, you know, it does cover really um, a lot of big topics, you know, socioeconomic hardship, um, beauty standards, um, the relationship and between men and women. Um, and, you know, and, and, and it's about these four friends and each of their arc um, and, generational trauma and filial piety. I mean, there's a lot, you got a lot going on, but it's all tethered by the lives of these characters. And that's that's what I found the most compelling. You know, we haven't talked at all about, I, I don't see any other questions right now, but um, let's see. Nope, okay, but if anyone has, oh, here's one, okay. From Liz Schick, another question on publishing. What for Francis is the hardest part of the book marketing process? That's a great question. And did your agent or editor provide guidance on touring, et cetera? Thank you. Good question. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's, I would say social media is the most harrowing part of an introverted writer. I do see other writers um, posting very frequently and so wittily and very candidly about their life. Whereas I think my personality, I just get so much anxiety about posting um, that I, I just kind of withdraw and end up not posting at all, <laughs> which is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Uh, I, that, yeah, the social media part is the, the hardest part for me, particularly. Touring, it's not really, for me, it's more about um, like my publicist will help set up events uh, like this one, <laughs> but it's it's more about um, interview requests and things like that. It's they don't necessarily have a tried and true formula for it, it really varies by the book. So for me, it's been a lot about you know Asian, um, panels and platforms um, and people that who are interested in the Korean story. That that's interesting to me to hear that, and and uh, it's a little discouraging, I'll be honest, um, because it does create these silos. You know, it, the book book breaks down the silos, but then in the way it's marketed, it kind of reinforces the silos. Um, and I guess, do you have any thoughts on that? Maybe I'm off base. I think the publisher does send out, you know, press releases to everyone they can for every book, but it, it does, um, it varies according to the book. Like what, yeah. What, where. Yeah, and there's so much competition and they have to find the niche. And um, we have a couple more questions and actually one of them, well, someone, someone, this is a little out of order because someone had put one up earlier. I don't want to neglect. Um, what kept you motivated to keep writing the book? And what would you tell yourself during a writing slump? Oh my gosh, it was so much desperation. I honestly, going to MFA was the biggest motivation for me because at that, you know, it was such a huge commitment that I went into debt for um, and you're, you're putting in so much time and money into this dream and it's really for me like oh I must do this or die kind of commitment and afterwards it was when I had kind of despair moments about oh I'll never be able to publish I would think okay but you know you really just have to because otherwise it will have been for nothing um, so that kind of desperation really motivated me uh, also, having children in a way motivated me because I was very desperate to get some time away from them. And this was a really great justification for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and and justifying to myself, like, why I, I needed some time out. 
because that's very hard to do when you're in the mom um, mentality of feeling so much guilt. It's, it's, it's really hard. And, and I mean, certainly I went through that when my kids were young. And I remember um, actually, I also lived in a, a brownstone in Brooklyn at that time. And I remember at one time, um, you know, I, I had a babysitter come into my apartment that doesn't, didn't really help me because I couldn't write in the same floor through. And I actually would sometimes sit on the stairwell of my, you know, brownstone, you know, using one step to sit on and another step to write on. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> I have so many stories about the crazy places I've written. So it's hard with kids. So I certainly sympathize with that. Um, we have another question here. Did you have particular authors in mind as you wrote the book? And did you suggest comparable books when you sought an agent? Well, certainly the comps are really important, right? But that must have been hard if there weren't a lot of Korean comps. And so it was kind of, I, I'm trying to remember what the first one was, but Crazy Rich Asians had come out, which was a huge success. And that was very surprising to everyone in publishing, I think, <laughs> that it was a success. And so even though um, it's not necessarily the best comp um, because you know it's about different countries entirely, I would say, oh, it's very contemporary. So Crazy Rich, rich Asians meets, um, I think I said Murakami because Murakami is also uh, writing about contemporary Japan and all the characters are Japanese. Of course it's translated but it's a contemporary Asian story in Asia, not, not an Asian American immigration story. So just trying to drive that point home. That's actually very interesting and helpful. It's very particular. You know, you were specific and, and intentional about what your comps were, which uh, from everything I've heard, the comps are incredibly important um, because it also, you know, we'd like to believe as writers that we do the writing work and then we give it to our agent and the publisher and they do the rest. And I, that's just not the case anymore. Writers have to do more and more of everything. Um, and even in marketing, you know, we know our book better than anyone. So, um, you know, giving an idea to when your agent is pitching your book to editors, having an idea of um, how the editor might market this book is a really important factor because you know one of the things i've learned is that as much as writing for us is our heart and soul books are a, a commodity and it's actually a business and they have to figure out how to sell these books and and especially with all of the incredible competition for our attention um and and tv and movies and um you know and and all the many many books out there you have to know how you're going to sell a particular book. So it's interesting that you came up with a very intentional and precise, you know, <laughs> comp search. I'm impressed. Yeah, you, it, I mean, it, it was kind of out of necessity because there really weren't any others out of Korea. Um, but I did try to do some, you know, other Asian stories at least. Well, listen, we're coming to the end um, and I wanna give you a chance. Is there anything we did not cover? Any story, any strange, weird thing that happened to you? Uh, I don't, actually, I have one question. When, um, you know, so the book came out and you had to, you're sort of um, navigate the world of social media. Ugh, God help you, <laughs> you know, we're all trying to do that. But you also probably got reviews. Did you get any negative responses? Was there any kind of backlash? Did you have any kind of, um, you know, because because there is that moment where you're suddenly your book is public and and that's must have been a little scary. It is very, very, very scary. Um, the thing about social media is that you are tagged in real time by readers as well. <laughs> so I'm um, just reading. Um, I, I would say there's there was a huge array of responses and certainly there were negative ones. Uh, and it, I think I just tried to erase them from my memory, <laughs> but um, yeah, you just, it, it takes a while to adjust and recalibrate going from you're hiding in the corner just by yourself in the dark writing with no, with despair that no one's ever going to read it to having 
it out in the world with all these opinions, you know, pouring in about about it. Um, I'm still recovering, honestly. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's no, that's really helpful. And yeah, even the positive reviews are are positive in a way that kind of sometimes made me uncomfortable. You know what we've been talking about. So that's uh, it's just a diff like if you're an introvert, it it just takes some time to recover. And the best way for me has just been to try to step away, honestly. That that's great advice, you know, because as a writer, you're right. We have to go into our private space, spend a lot of time there, and that's very different from what's required. Uh, um, in getting your book out there into the public. So um, yeah, I, I have to say just uh, because of this is the Columbia event, I am so grateful to the Fiction Foundry. Again, I was mentioning in the beginning, but it really helped me kind of jumpstart my second start into writing. And then after a while, I, I felt, because at that time it meant it met once a month. And I felt so desperate that I needed to produce um, quickly and that I had no time. I, we kind of broke off, a few of us broke off from the foundry into a weekly workshop. And we met every single week with submissions every week. And that was, I think, the most helpful thing ever. So I highly recommend if you, know, if you have someone you really trust in terms of feedback, um, and someone you don't mind spending an hour a week with. That's great advice. I think that feedback loop is so incredibly important. Um, and once a week, you know, that's you, you obviously were very motivated because that's hard to produce hard. on a weekly basis. But, you know, I, 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 we have to end. I could keep talking to you forever. But um, that, um, you know, I think that's also an indication of the real the, the work ethic, you know, that the work doesn't happen on its own. And it's it, it you have to put the work in and the time in and, and obviously you did. And um, and we have this wonderful, wonderful book to show for it and another one on its way. So um, I won't ask you when it's coming out, but because um, that's too much pressure. But we know it's in the pipeline and um, that's exciting. And it's just been so much fun to talk to you, Francis. Thank you for making the time. And no one, Francis told us ahead of time that there was a little bit of construction in her building and they were very kind and generous. I didn't hear a peep. And my lawn guys didn't start you know, blowing their leaf blowers. So uh, the stars all came into alignment for this. And um, thank you so much, Francis. Here, I really appreciate it, everybody. And best of best of luck in your writing if you are writing. Thank you. And yes, thank you for our audience. It's sort of awful not to be able to see you. Normally, I actually really like to talk to the audience and bring them in. But thank you to um, the Columbia Alumni Association and Jenna, who has been, um, you know, Jenna Farley Fleming, who's been just an incredible, oh, there she is. It's been an amazing help. Um, you know, I am personally deeply grateful. So um, thank you for everyone. And um, we'll do this again. In the meantime, enjoy this day. Bye. Bye.